A big thanks to Ghostbed for sponsoring this week's episode. Can't get to sleep. Maybe it's nightmares or maybe it's just an uncomfortable mattress. With Ghostbed, you can finally get the scary good sleep that you deserve. For more than two decades, Ghostbed has been making mattresses, pillows, and other sleep products designed for maximum comfort and support. Tired of waking up in a cold sweat? Every Ghost Bed mattress features signature cooling materials, including their patented Ghost Ice technology, so you can fall asleep faster and stay asleep longer. Get fast and free shipping with most orders shipping within 24 hours, plus you'll get a 101 night sleep trial, with free returns if you're not 100% comfortable on your new mattress. For a limited time, our listeners can get 30% off Ghost Bed mattresses plus two free pillows. Use promo code MrCreeps at ghostbed.com slash creepscast to take advantage of the offer. That's ghostbed.com slash creepscast with promo code MrCreeps. Before I start, I want to know if you're worth saving. I wonder if this was you. If this was your decision, what would you do? Would you give in and surrender yourself to your fate and be comforted with the fact that you have saved billions of lives? Or run? Have you ever been punished for something which wasn't your fault? It sucks, doesn't it? When I was in kindergarten, Jonas Lockhart complained someone had stolen his milk and made such a big deal about it, kicking and screaming and stamping his feet, that our teacher had strictly told us that None of us would be getting milk for the rest of the week until the thief came forward. They didn't, obviously. We all knew you didn't hide milk because it would get warm and lumpy. The culprit had quickly swiped the contents and cleverly hidden the evidence right under everyone's nose. So our teacher kept a word and made sure that none of us had milk for the rest of the week. Instead, she brought in apple juice boxes which tasted sour. That day would then go on to be labeled the Great Milk Incident and was the sole reason behind the genius idea to start marking names on each kid's carton. I remember sitting cross-legged on prickly carpet, squeezing my half-empty apple juice. I was seething. It wasn't fair. I wanted to cry out. It wasn't fair that we all had to be punished for someone else's stupid mistake. I had no idea how good I had it. I had the luxury of being a naive child, being able to wear rose-tinted glasses, and to have no idea they were even shading my eyes, protecting me from a secret my town didn't even try to hide. I was six when I realized life wasn't as good as I thought, and milk thieves weren't the only bad thing in the world. Noah Sharp was the town's golden boy, and destined for an Ivy League. He was also my mother's friend's son, and he often came around to hang out and watch a SpongeBob SquarePants with me after school. I remember Noah had a great laugh and told jokes that made me spew milk out of my nose. Noah Sharp was my mother's murderer, and the worst part, he didn't even know that he was doing it, didn't even have control over his actions. This is what I was told at least. I was told that Noah would never intentionally murder my mom. I didn't understand what was happening when my mom locked all the doors one night and told me to hide under the kitchen table. I knew there was a certain day every year where I had to stay extra quiet and not go near the doors or windows. But mom had never told me to get under the table. She always protected me from figuring out what was really going on from tearing off my rose-tinted glasses and seeing reality for what it truly was. A town suffocated by a curse, which turned the senior class into monsters. And it had recently taken hold of Littlewood's golden boy. I hadn't been expecting Noah to break through the window along with three others. I recognized them as other seniors that he hung out with. Poppy, who worked at the diner, she always gave me extra chocolate syrup on my Sunday. And then there was Lucy, 
our paper girl who always smiled at me wildly and asked if there were fairies in my yard. I used to feel safe around them, enjoying their hissed conversations and giggles. I liked it when they came over to talk to me and complimented my Patrick Star shirt. I didn't understand why mom was so scared of them at first. The four of them looked exactly like the elder kids that I knew. But something was wrong, and I was too young to see it. These kids were devils hiding in plain sight. Monsters bleeding from the dark. Shadows with no faces. Noah was the first to come through the door, whistling a Disney song that I automatically knew. You've got a friend in me. Something ice cold slithered down my spine when I saw him swinging a carving knife around like he knew exactly how to use it. His footsteps were slow and calculated, playful as he stepped back and forth, laughing, calling out if anyone was home while my mom pushed me under the table and stepped in front of it, blocking me from his view. I remember the gleam in his eye when he walked in and found my sobbing mother begging him to get back. I started to tell her that it was Noah and that he would never hurt us, even after catching his fingers tightening around the wooden handle of the knife. The twist in his lips nodded my tummy. The friendly smile that I had known for most of my life was gone. Everything that I knew of him was gone. Noah didn't see me under the table the night that he had grabbed my mother by the neck, wrenched her head back and sliced open her until she was spluttering and gurgling on her own blood. The human mind is a strange thing. It will automatically try and block out potential trauma before you can fully register it. But there was no way that I couldn't. There was no way that I couldn't see what had happened to my mom. Noah didn't stop with her throat. He went to her stomach until the teeth of the blade was slick red. And he was panting, laughing, and giggling into my mother's hair. I remember watching pooling red stain her prized carpet and wondering if she was going to get mad and then realizing that my mom wasn't moving. The four of them left after trashing my living room. The other three bound out of the front door while Noah grabbed our TV and flung it at the window, shattering the glass. It was when the strangled cry escaped my lips and his head whipped around, dark eyes shining in the dim. He didn't even look at me. Noah looked straight through me, his mouth breaking into a monstrous grin. He was covered in her, covered in my mother, startling red, spattering his face and coating his hair. But he didn't seem to care, instead of reveling in it in his own undoing. It was an insanity I didn't know understand or knew existed, but I knew that it was him. It was all of him, everything that made the boy up. A lapse in lucidity and a madness twisting his expression into a monster that I had imagined under my bed. He scanned the kitchen for a moment, half-lidded eyes flicking back and forth, before bidding me a salute and diving out into the night. I stayed under the table until sunrise, just like mom had told me. Every other year she had treated it like a game, and I had been too blinded by excitement to realize that it was a distraction. Okay, B. Mom whispered into my hair through panicked breathing. We're going to play a fun new game. What kind of game? I asked, flinching when I felt her body seize up her quivering hand coming to rest over my mouth. There was a bang from outside, followed by laughter. Mom ducked down lower, holding me tighter, so tight that I thought I was going to suffocate against her woolly sweater. We're going to see how long we can stay under here, she breathed, and you have to stay extra, extra quiet, okay? And with my mom's phantom words ringing in my head, I buried my face in my knees and stayed as still and quiet as possible. I could hear them outside. Without mom to clamp her hands over my ears and black them out, they were in vivid clarity that I couldn't ignore or deny. 
their war cries and whooping, cheering and laughing from boys and girls alike, followed by screaming, the sound of a baseball bat shattering a windscreen, and thundering footsteps as they ran past my house like animals. The noise bled into the night and then the early hours. There was a girl's voice at the door. She asked if there was anyone inside, and I opened my mouth to tell her that my mommy was hurt, that I was scared. Um, but she started laughing and I could hear the crack of her head slamming into the hardwood. She didn't stop. I wanted her to stop, but she continued, moving around the house and banging on the windows. The girl never came inside, making it her goal to make sure I stayed stiff, paralyzed to the spot. The next day, the police found me. I couldn't move. My mother's blood was congealing on the carpet and the police officer wearing a forced smile took me away from my mom's still body in my trashed house and I found myself living with my aunt. I wanted to know why Noah and his friends had taken my mother away from me, but I was only kept in the dark and given lame excuses because apparently the truth was too much for a little kid to handle. So I continued to live in the dark. I did notice days and weeks after my mom's death that I didn't see any elder kids. I usually saw them biking around town or in the diner talking over burgers and milkshakes, but there was no sign of them. No sign of Noah. The town had been turned upside down. Store windows still smoldering from being set alight. Crumbling houses with their windows smashed through. There was a flower memorial in the town square, and then a candlelit vigil that I was urged to attend. It wasn't just my mom they had taken. They had killed others too. Other families, other moms and dads. Kids. But I couldn't understand why. I got my answer a few years later. When our mayor first told my third grade class about Littlewood's curse, use the example that I gave you, the stupid milk story. I don't know if the teacher had told him or maybe it was just a coincidence. I personally think that it was too soft in the blow. If you straight up tell a group of little kids that their fate is becoming a twisted psychopaths in 11 years, they're going to freak out, and rightfully so. However, if you add something they recognize, like putting on the voice of a well-known cartoon character, or in this case, using the story of the Great Milk Incident as a metaphor, we would be more likely to understand. And we did, sort of. I got the idea anyway. He didn't explain it very well, often tripping over his words and using the manic hand gestures, but I managed to understand. After all, I desperately wanted an explanation behind what had happened to my mother from a boy that I had trusted with my life, only for him and most of the older kids in town to vanish without a trace, without repercussions for their actions. According to the mayor, October 1st, 1799, 20 18 year olds died in a tragic fire and their souls had refused to pass on refused to forgive a town which let them die. So these kids decided to take it out on us. You see kids, sometimes you'll get punished for things that are not your fault. Our mayor had told us, and that's okay. It was a last to screw you to future generations who had absolutely nothing to do with their death. It was the townspeople who had screwed them over. So why were we in the firing line? It didn't make any sense to me. The town didn't call it a curse. We were supposed to call it a phenomenon. But the deceased spirits of ancient kids who refused to die, filling every generation's head and turning them into twisted psychopaths, it definitely wasn't a phenomenon. We were cursed. They had turned Noah into my mother's killer and would do that every year following, including my class. The youth of our town were cursed to be murderers from sunset to sunrise. And what did we do? Well, nothing. Because what could we do? Leaving town wasn't an option. 
Apparently, neighboring towns were convinced that it was some kind of virus which could spread. So anyone under the age of 18 was stuck, literally and figuratively. If we tried to leave, regardless of age, we were locked away in a room of white. I should know. I tried to skip town at the age of 10 and I spent three months in a specialized hospital ward. Which leads me to last year, October 2021. It was my 17th teen purge, and the first time that I had actually been caught up in it. I wouldn't count the time when I was six. I was merely an observer, as I watched my mother butchered right in front of me. Noah and his class were identified as her killers, but as far as I knew, they had gotten a pass because it wasn't technically their fault. I found out from my aunt that the senior class were shipped off quietly the morning of October 3rd to avoid complications. I never saw them again, which was a good thing. If I ever saw Noah's face again, I knew that I would hurt him. The child inside of me didn't care about a stupid curse. I had still seen him kill mom with his own hands. His twisted smile and glittering eyes. As I grew up, I grew less frightened of the teen purge and more curious. By the age of 12, I was guarding my front door wielding a baseball bat. I only had a vague notion of self-defense. But if the door so much as rattled, I knew my cowardice would send me hurtling up the stairs and barricading myself in the room. I didn't think that I would ever wake up tied to a sun lounger with Olivia Rodrigo blasting in my ears. But I guess there's a first for everything. That's what you get when you turn Gen Z into twisted psychos. I had a vague memory of locking my aunt's doors and windows as usual and giving her a hug before she left for the night shift. I went upstairs to my room, crawled into bed, and drifted off to the sound of Super Eye Patch Wolf's most recent retrospective on a TV show that I didn't even watch. I don't remember them snatching me from my room just the aftermath, and a vague memory of a girl with a Cheshire cat grin throwing my laptop against my bedroom wall. The Wonderland smile. That's what I had pegged that look of insanity on their faces. I awoke with a dull pounding in both my temples and the dizzy in realization that I had been thwacked from behind. A baseball bat maybe, more lead pipe. Wakey wakey. The guy's shriek sounded like nails on a chalkboard. Someone cranked the music louder and I was enveloped in a sense of utter surrealness, pushing away the fog in my brain and my spinning head, trying to jar itself off of its axis. Maybe I had been infected with the Littlewood curse a year early, because hysterical guffaws of laughter were bubbling and brewing in my throat, threatening to let rip. I felt honored in a way. I had actually been invited to a senior party. I had been trying to sneak into one for three years and they had let me in for free. The idiots even escorted me themselves. If I was going to die before I was inevitably turned into a monster, which would rip away an innocent life in my future, so be it right. Taking a moment to swallow my laughter when I really shouldn't have been laughing in that situation, I assessed my surroundings. I was kneeling on something plastic, my bare knees stinging from stagnating in the same position. I definitely wasn't alone. I counted at least three pairs of hands that bound to mine in what felt like jump rope, and something was stuck to my face. Silly string. I knew this sting from my childhood where I thought it was a good idea to spray silly string all over my aunt's living room. There was also certain things that I was trying to ignore. I had been hit hard enough to send my brain spiraling, and the more that I thought about the possibility of brain damage, I was just freaking myself out and imagining things. I was fine. The blood running down my chin and tainting my lips was normal, especially in a town like Littlewood where it was the norm to find cannibalized townies strung up around the town like they were prizes. Hey, someone was in front of me. I could feel their breath tickling my face. 
It stunk of rot. I said, wakey, wakey. Huh? What was that, Taryn? The sound of tape being ripped from flesh made me cringe. Taryn was a freshman boy who lived down the road from me. I said, screw you. He was met with hyena-like shrieks of laughter, and I bowed my head, panting into uncomfortable stickiness against my lips. Was I really going to die? But when I finally managed to pry my eyes open, my vision was a confusing blur of nothing before I shook my head, hopefully dislodging my brain from the puddle of maple syrup that it had rolled into. As my vision returned slowly, I found myself staring at a pool of glittering water. It was an overwhelmingly beautiful sight, or maybe that was just the concussion talking. Ignoring the boy crouched in front of me, I focused on gentle ripples of water glittering under hypnotic lights, a stray beer can floating on the surface. I was kneeling on a bright orange sun lounger with three other bodies uncomfortably pressed to mine and at least three layers of duct tape over my mouth. The boy crouching in front of me was Tommy Nolan, a quiet senior on the school newspaper who looked like he was dying inside if you looked him directly in the eye. Under the control of Littlewood's curse, however, Tommy Nolan adapted the same psychotic grin and glittering look in his eyes, like it would thrill him just to cut me open and see what was inside. He had already started, I noticed his latest victims once opening my eyes, and judging from the muffled shrieks and violent squirming from the others tied to me, so would they. I was trying to concentrate on my own life, teetering on the edge of the immortal coil, but every so often my half-lidded eyes would find the startling spatter of red, glistening under patio lights, which caused a visceral reaction that I was struggling to keep under a cool facade. There was nothing like showing them that you were terrified. I think I could have actually died that night. My body ripped apart and my head put on a spike for the rest of the time to see the next morning. But sometimes miracles happen. And that miracle happened to be loose restraints. I remember being paralyzed to the spot, staring wide-eyed at the trail of gods splattered across the patio. Handprints and smiley faces written in pooling crimson. They didn't just kill the owners of the house. They played with their bodies, marking their presence with entrails. I was aware of a girl jumping up from the sun lodger and grabbing my hand, urging me to run with her, and I did. I ran, I didn't look back, but they weren't following us. Like zombies or vampires or any other mythical monster, Tommy and his group had caught movement ahead of them and gone in for the kill. While I was running, I made a silent pact with myself that I had to die before I turned 18. I would, I don't know. I'd throw myself in front of a car or something, but I wouldn't become one of them. But there's a huge difference between thinking about doing something and actually doing it. I tried. I stepped out in front of traffic in the summer with full intention to throw myself in front of a truck, except my legs wouldn't move. When I tried to move them, my body stiffened up and my brain freaked out. I tried at doing other things, but I only ended up in the emergency room. I couldn't do it. Something inside me still wanted to live. My 18th birthday came and went, and before I knew it, I was biking to school on October 1st, 2022. Five hours before the curse took effect and I was late for quarantine. The town had no way to stop us causing havoc after trying every method in the recent years, but nothing worked. If we were knocked out, we would wake up seconds later. If we were tied up, we would pull ourselves out of our restraints. The quarantine was the school's attempt at locking us in, but every year they got out, so I didn't exactly have hope for our year. I wasn't thinking much of anything at that moment. I was just enjoying the cool grays of wind on my cheeks and blowing back my hair. I was watching a spiral of fall leaves caught up in a whirlwind when my phone vibrated in my pocket. I hesitantly pulled it out with one hand. 
Is it me or are people being even worse to us today? The voice was familiar and immediately put me in a better mood. Kenji. I had been anxiously waiting for him to call most of the day. It's you. No, but if you just listen to me, I have solid evidence. I felt my lips pricking into a smile. You're paranoid, I said with an eye roll. Across the street, though, an old woman was staring directly at me as I biked past. Mrs. Renfield was the owner of the local thrift shop and used to offer me candy bars when I was a little kid. I was so used to her kind smile and the wrinkle between her brow like she was permanently deep in thought. But right then, she was just standing there, eyes narrowed, like I was a freakish devil spawn. Ignoring a shiver slithering down my spine, I focused on the road. I retract that statement, I murmured. Mrs. Renfield just shot me the death glare. And Kenji scoffed. No, Mrs. Renfield has always given people the death stare. It's like her quirk. Uh, nope. Tightening my one-handed grip on my handlebars, I pedaled faster. And this time, it was definitely personal. Ouch, he said. I mean, it makes sense though, right? Everyone hates us. We're the town pariahs until sunrise. I spluttered. Wow, that makes me feel so much better. Uh, thanks, Kenji. His laugh loosened the knot of my gut. You're really bad at sarcasm, he said. Ooh, wait, I can see you ahead. I could hear him behind me. His yell entangled in a particularly tumultuous gust of wind, which almost sent me tumbling. B, hey, slow down. I did, twisting around to see Kenji catching up to me. He was a fast-moving blur of dark brown hair spiraling in the wind and kicking legs going to town on his pedals. It was the worst day of all our lives and yet he was still smiling. I liked that about him. The world could be ending and Kenji would still have an infectious grin on his face. I couldn't help smiling when he finally caught up to me. And Kenji was your average, conventionally attractive guy. Tall and athletic with a Hollywood smile and striking Asian-American features which had been described as exotic by our classmates until he called them out, and rightfully so. Kenji didn't take any crap and smiled at the world like it wasn't royally screwing him over. I think that's why I gravitated towards them. Hey look, no hands, he yelled behind me, and I twisted around to laugh. Are you trying to fall? Maybe. His laugh caught in the wind. I could hear his panting breaths getting closer and closer. Yo. Kenji saluted me with a two-fingered salute. When I got a proper look at his expression, his smile wasn't as bright as usual. It wasn't surprising considering that it was our judgment day. But somehow he still expected him to push his way through the negativity. I guess I was wrong. When I caught his eye, he wasn't quite looking at me, more like right through me. His thoughts elsewhere, probably with his mom. There was a haunted vacancy in his eyes that I couldn't bring myself to fully take in. Like he was already being twisted hours before. Still though, when I forced a smile this way, he seemed to snap out of it and he shook his head, sucking in a lungful of air. Now don't you just love the smell of pollution and cat poop at this time in the evening? Oh yeah, I shot him a grin. Nothing like the stink of an animal's decaying digestive system to make me feel alive. He laughed before piping up with, What would you do if an asteroid was destined to hit us? Weird question. I don't know, I guess I'd spend as much time as possible with my loved ones. Man, what if you could stop it? The asteroid? I scoffed. How? He tipped his head back and groaned. Dude, just answer. Well, yeah, I said. Of course I would stop it if it's going to kill billions of people and end life as we know it. Kenji's smile darkened slightly. Even if the asteroid had killed you in the process. Something about his words drew the breath from my lungs. Why are you asking me this? He looked like he might reply before seemingly deciding against it. 
Whatever he wanted to say had faded, when the curl in his lip had pricked into a smile. Now I'm just envisioning going to visit my dad before Christmas. If I can get through tonight, I'm good. I couldn't help but notice that every store in the town center was either closed or shutting down early. There was a little girl standing outside the hardware store clutching an iPad. When she caught my eye, she ducked her head. I knew exactly how she felt. When I was a kid and knew of Littlewood's curse, I hated the elder kids. I wanted them gone. For killing my mom and for ruining my life. That's a good way to think, I said swallowing hard. You literally have the 15 sleeps till Christmas mentality. He snorted. Hey, it's better to laugh than cry, right? The closer that we were getting to school, I was feeling progressively sicker. What are your plans for after? After? Uh, when we're kicked out of town, I said. I heard that there's a halfway house they're sending us to, but don't you want to run? He chuckled. Where will we go? They said that they were going to protect us and continue our education until we get to college. I sent him a look. Do you honestly want to stay in some halfway house under constant surveillance? And that's if we don't. I trailed off. But to my surprise, he continued in a sharp breath, his tone darkening. What if we brutally murder someone? Oh, well, yeah, I said. But that, that's not going to happen. This time, Kenji laughed harshly. I'd say the odds are fairly against us considering our town's a track record. We stopped at some stops, but Kenji kept going, speeding up. Something warm crept up my throat and I kicked myself into a manic pedal. Oh, what are you doing? Kenji came to a stop and twisted around. A thought experiment, he said, trailing the sidewalk with the heels of his Doc Martens. If I fall and die, won't that save my future victim? He laughed, but it was choked, almost hysterical. If I'm, if I'm destined to kill someone, and I die right here right now, won't they live? I'll be saving someone instead of murdering them. This time, he wasn't even trying to hide at the hollow look in his eyes. He was smiling, but it was too big. A gaping grimace. Almost a wonderland smile. Kenji, I said sharply. Stop. He did. Coming to an abrupt halt before his bike could hurtle down the steps. He was panting, his grip tightening on his handlebars. I'm going to see my dad, he said. I'm going to see my dad as soon as this is all over. And I've left the halfway house. And everything, everything will be okay. He turned to me with hopeful eyes. Right? Oh, we're going to be okay, B. I swallowed words, suffocating my mouth all the way to school. I couldn't give him the response that he wanted. When we arrived at school, Kenji and I were cuffed and led to the gymnasium where most of the senior class already were. If it weren't for the glitter of silver I caught on everyone's wrist, I would have thought that I was walking into a pep rally. It wasn't as dystopian as I had imagined. Spirits were unusually high. At least they were on one side. The varsity team were hyping each other up for reasons that nobody knew. Lily Marriott was trying to lift morale by preaching to a group of wide-eyed kids about God and that he was going to protect us. P.S. I didn't say that though, as Kenji led me to the middle of the room where most of our class were either lying in their jackets or staring at the wall looking like they wanted the ground to swallow them up. And Kenji dropped down onto the floor with a smile way too wide for someone who had a 99.9% .9 chance of committing a felony against his will, leaning back on his elbows. He pulled out his earphones. I followed, hesitantly sitting next to him. I heard if you listen to loud music, the curse doesn't get you. Kenji murmured, untangling his earphones. That's just another lie. Jonas Lockhart slumped on with us and I caught the exact moment Kenji decided he was going to shuffle closer towards me. And Kenji was out of the closet and had been crushing on Jonas since a freshman year. He revealed said crush while drunk at a junior prom, only for Jonas to ignore him and then make out with Wendy Carmichael ten minutes later. 
drama. Since then, Kenji had made it his mission to keep his distance, and Jonas wasn't getting the hint. I had a feeling that Jonas was struggling with his own sexuality, and Kenji was kind of impatient. Also, they were both too stubborn to admit feelings and they were being equally immature. Still though, at least Jonas was trying. He plucked an earphone from the boy and corked one into his ear. Fleetwood Mac. Jonas nodded with a smile. Nice. With his hand still cuffed in front of him, Kenji awkwardly yanked the earphone from the guy with a skull. I'm sorry, do you hear something, B? He pretended to squint. I can't see anyone though, but I can hear a slight breeze. Oh, you're a comedian, Kenji. Jonas rolled his eyes. I just wanted to know if you want to have a smoke. I know a guy who can uncuff us before Mrs. Hill catches us. He leaned back with a sigh. You know, before we're all turned into actual crazies. Nah, I'm okay, Kenji murmured. Jonas cocked a brow. Oh, really? Because there are some things we should probably talk about. Uh, maybe if you want to. I said I'm okay. Kenji. I nudged him when Jonas jumped up and walked away. His shoulder just thumbed. You do realize that he's trying to talk to you, right? He avoided my side eye, a smile crawling on his lips. Oh, I know, but it's more fun to ignore him. You two look like crap. When Kenji looked up and I followed his gaze. Our third musketeer was looming over us. Amira. She was hiding behind the thick red curls that she usually tied in a ponytail. You can talk. Kenji's expression dampened, and I noticed her smeared eyeliner. Have you been crying? Mira plonked down next to me, burying her head in her knees. My mom didn't even text me to say goodbye. She mumbled into her tights. I can understand how it must feel for her, but it's like she already thinks I'm going to hurt someone tonight. Your mom's kind of terrible. Kenji patted her on the shoulder. No offense. No, she is. Mira sniffled. She gave birth to me in this stupid town. How is it my fault that I was born here? I grabbed her hand and squeezed it. Did she not text you at all? Nope. Mira choked out a laugh. She left for work before I even woke up. I hated that part of me understood why Mira's mom chose to distance herself, but it still hurt. The three of us talked for a while about everything and nothing at all. TV shows and movies and what our thoughts were on the latest TikTok trend. Anything to take our minds off of the time, which was ticking by. I watched the sky darken outside, and the expressions on the guards at the door start to tighten. They were starting to panic. I could see it in their faces. It was around 5 to 8 when I started to get restless and my stomach was doing flip-flops. Every year the same feeling hit me like a wave of ice water and I always thought of Noah and what he did to my mother. It was a memory that I couldn't get away from. In past years I had distracted myself, but I was in the eye of the storm, which was only getting closer. It was between 8 and 8.30 when the curse took effect, according to the mayor. He never gave us a specific time, so thanks for that. And I really needed to go to the bathroom. I was starting to feel sick to my stomach, my mouth watering with the looming sensation of barf creeping its way up my throat. Excusing myself from a conversation that I was only half listening to, I jumped to my feet, struggling with my cupped hands. Pushing my way through seniors, I headed to the exit doors where a crowd of guards had all congregated. One one of them had situated himself in front of me with a no-nonsense skull. I couldn't resist glancing at the weapon attached to his belt. A bathroom, I said, when he shooed me away like I was a raccoon. I think I'm going to be sick. The guard's lips twisted. Yeah, we'll bring you a bucket, he grunted. No, I found myself saying stiffly. No, I need to go to the bathroom. I really don't want to throw up in here. I don't know if I looked pathetic enough for him to have sympathy, or if he just wanted to get rid of me. 
but the guard stepped aside and let me back out onto the hallway. I was surprised that no guards followed me. Thankfully, I didn't spew my guts. When I was on my way back to the auditorium, a group of people in white marched past me. I didn't think anything of it until I saw what they were carrying with thick, gloved hands, plastic masks over their faces, metal canisters. Making sure to keep my distance, I followed them to the janitor's closet, which was pulled open. Looking at the canisters, at first I thought that it was gas, but then I caught splashes of something dripping down the side. It was clear like water but was slightly thicker and had a potent stink which seeped into my nose and throat. It was strong stuff. They were going into the sprinkler system. I knew from several years back when a junior had tried to douse the cafeteria in Gatorade for a prank. When one of the people in white heaved a canister into his arms, I started to back away slowly, my heart in my throat, my brain already in overdrive. Whatever they were putting in the sprinklers was man-made, I thought, pushing myself into a stumbled run. So if that substance was what was turning kids psycho every year, did that mean that there wasn't a curse? I made it back onto the hallway and I couldn't breathe. The auditorium was right in front of me, no sign of guards, but when I slammed my fists into the door it was locked. I pressed my face against the glass glimpsing Kenji sitting with Mira. My gaze went to the ceiling and to the sprinklers, but it didn't make sense. Why would they do this? Eighteen years of lies, I thought dizzily. What were they doing to us? How did destroying their own town and killing their own people benefit them? When I found my voice, I pounded against the door. Get out, I screamed, tackling with a handle. It wasn't Kenji who had locked eyes with me. It was a girl that I didn't know. She looked up from her phone, her gaze meeting mine. Her hopeful smile twisted into a look of fright. I kicked the door. Out, I yelled, pointing at the ceiling. I twisted around, searching for guards. Sprinklers. What? She started to get up and started to call out to me. But rough arms were snaking around my waist. A clammy hand slamming a wet rag over my mouth. I opened my mouth to scream, but I was already breathing it in. That toxic stink that I had seen dripping down the side of the canister. The arms holding me tightened their grip, and my senses were drowned up by the smell seeping inside me, poisoning my lungs. But it wasn't just inside my lungs. It was in my blood, heavy in my bones and bleeding into my brain. I was aware of being yanked to my feet, but I couldn't stand. The auditorium doors were behind me, and I was being dragged back down the corridor. My body felt fake like it wasn't even mine. I could feel it like a parasite, a virus leeching itself onto my skull. My brain was on fire. Everything was on fire. Through half-lidded eyes, I was aware of something dripping onto my face. It came slowly, splashing out of my cheeks before waves of red were hitting me. A scarlet waterfall of glistening red. It was staining me, bleeding into me before it began to rain down. It was warm and wet, drenching me, turning me into its canvas. At first, I tried to get away, but my feet were glued to the floor. But as the parasite inside my skull gained the upper hand, I stopped, trying to tear out my hair and rake my fingernails down my face. Blinking rapidly, I saw a fire. I saw blurs of orange and yellow enveloping, squirming flesh, catching light. And I heard screams, guttural cries, crying out for death. And I could feel them. All of them. All of their pain, all of their agony. Seventeen years of memories hitting me one by one like bolts of lightning. I thought that was what turned us. That was what twisted us into monsters. A reminder of every other year. Every maniacal laugh. Because when I came to, I was no longer in school. The first thing I noticed through blurry vision was that I was crouched in front of a squirming figure and above me. 
The sky was a colorful deluge of yellows and oranges and pinks. Sunrise. Slowly, my gaze flicked from the pretty sunrise to the figure, who slowly bled into a shadow and then a woman, whose eyes that I had plucked to clear me out. They were in my hands, squished between my fist, and my lips were split wide open like I had carved a wonderland smile onto my own face. I could still feel the rush of adrenaline I had felt while hacking a man's head off and taking my time, scooping out each of the woman's eyes with a spoon doused in salt. I wasn't thinking about the woman begging for me to enter, and the headless torso of her husband at my feet. I wasn't thinking about my hands, the slick scarlet and the taste of rotting flesh in my mouth. I was still seeing flashes in my head, memories which weren't mine. A school bus and blurred faces around me. Someone else's thoughts were inside my head. I shook them away. All I could think about was a little wood's curse. As I turned around slowly and pushed myself into a run, my gaze finding the sun slowly rising over the horizon. I was halfway across to town which had been ripped apart over the last few hours. Headless bodies littered the streets. Cars had been destroyed, buildings set on fire. 2022's class had really given the other years a run for their money. I found my phone in my pocket, a text lighting up the notifications. A text sent 10 minutes ago. It was from Kenji. Oh, we need to talk now. I'm at the scrapyard, come alone. Bad people around. Kenji, I thought. Swiping my bloody hands on my shirt, it wouldn't come off. My thoughts were spiraling. I needed to find him, but how? How had he texted me if the sun was only just rising? I was caked in blood, which wasn't mine and it wouldn't come off. I was painted in it. When I caught sight of Emily Carter on her knees, sobbing into what was left of her own mother, I started to wonder. For the first time in 18 years, my mind was clearer. This curse. Who really started it? Dearest Blank, I don't want to say your name because then I'll feel the need to say so much more, and I'll end up writing far too much. Names are hard for me. You lost yours a while ago, at least in my mind. I stopped calling you Blank. You were just a monster. A murderer. I know you won't read this, but I'm putting this out there anyway. I want to talk to you. I guess this is my way of apologizing. You're the first in a long list of people that I want to say goodbye to. I feel like you were the one who started this. You were the one who opened my eyes to a little wood's curse. I've been so angry for so many years. I have felt so much pain agony, the kind I can't even explain. It's like drowning. I've wanted to kill you so many times, often dreaming about it the older that I became. You stopped having an identity in my nightmares and became a faceless shadow suffocating my chest. I never thought that I would be writing this because you have always been a monster to me. I never thought that I would have to apologize to a monster. You and your class and every class in the past and present and future. Monsters. Even my own presently. 2022. Ironically enough, blank, we're actually the worst ones. Yeah, that's right. The class of 2022 really outdid all of you. I finally understood what it might have been like for you. I understand that craving you felt, to kill, to destroy, and that nothing would get in your way. We would kill parents, strangers, and children, until sunrise, until the curse was lifted and we were given back our souls, only to be hollow inside, broken. I know what it feels like to be alone and abandoned by the ones you thought that you could trust. I never knew where you had gone after you ripped our town apart, but I didn't care. I wanted you gone blank, so I didn't have to see your stupid face. But now I know the truth, 
and I can only wish you some kind of peace. I know it's impossible to think, even when part of me knows your fate, but I hope that you got away from there. I hope part of you is still planning to come and visit me. Lastly, I hope that you can forgive me for hating you for so long. I wish you told me. I know that I was a little kid, but you could have told me what was going to happen to you. To you, Lucy and Poppy. If you had, maybe mom might be here. Who am I kidding? If you didn't kill her 11 years ago, I probably would have this year. After all, it's always a loved ones. Is that why you killed her, Blank? Did she mean something to you? Did I? Anyway, thank you for being there when I was a kid. Thank you for making me laugh and spew milk out of my nose. Thank you for killing my mother before I did it myself and surrendered at the last dregs of my humanity. I'll remember you, Blank. Not just the flashes that I saw of you, the ones that you put inside my head, and the times that mattered. Love, B. Was I having an aneurysm? Pressing my forehead against the cool brick of a crumbling wall, I reveled in the stink of burning which was thankfully blocking out the horrific taste of skin, slithering back up my throat as I heaved up the contents of my stomach. I was used to the stink of charred human flesh. After all, the town was burning and its victims were our feast. Our prizes. I chose not to look around me or take in my surroundings. I didn't want to look at a town which we had ripped apart once again. I didn't want to see bodies littering the roads and sidewalk. Chunks of flesh and torsos lying in unsuspecting places. So many thoughts were alive inside my head. An endless hurricane of both nothing and everything, gliding into a vicious void that I couldn't explain, couldn't understand, couldn't stop. And yet that thought in particular was the one which reigned dominant. It had to be an aneurysm, right? I didn't feel like I had cracked my head or something had seriously gone wrong inside my brain. I was burning. I remembered googling the term in middle school when I had a crappy headache, and my aunt had dropped the word in conversation with the doctor. Oh, what if it's an aneurysm? He had chuckled in reply. It's just a pressure headache, Miss Levi. Suffice to say, once I knew what an aneurysm was, I closed down my aunt's laptop and crawled under my bed, like I could hide from something like that. I remember reading it on WebMD, not exactly the best place to check your symptoms, but 11 year old me wanted answers to the pounding pain, which felt like somebody slamming a rock onto the back of my head and temples. Nausea and vomiting, uh, yep. It felt like my insides were attempting to projectile vomit my organs. A stiff neck. Eh, sort of. I felt stiff all over. My whole body aching like I had just been through a meat grinder. I blurred her double vision. My vision wasn't mine. I was seeing things that I shouldn't. A world which wasn't from my perspective. Sensitivity to light. The sunrise was pretty harsh on my eyes. I wasn't ready to see broad daylight and what exactly my class had done to our town. I never saw burning as a symptom. I never saw a never-ending inferno inside your brain, eating you from the inside as a symptom. I wouldn't call it an aneurysm, but it definitely was something. I don't know how to explain the immense pressure in my head. Like something alive was bleeding inside my brain and latching onto me. Burning. I was, I was burning. Everything inside me was burning and I couldn't stop it. I couldn't put this ferocious blaze out because it was inside my skull. Despite being in denial, I didn't feel like myself anymore. Like my soul had been forced back inside my body which didn't belong to me. 
a body which had been twisted and purged of everything she was, and turned into a monster, puppeteered by the curse. I was still running on adrenaline, a senseless and mindless craving ripping through all logic. It was still alive inside me, and grating my teeth together in a wonderland smile which I couldn't stop, which was stretched so wide across my face that my jaw felt like it was going to concave. I remembered flashes of my before, before I woke up, before a little wood gave me my mind back. I had brutally killed a woman and her husband, carving their eyes out and teasing them with their last breaths with the hope of survival, only to rip away their life before that hope could blossom inside of them. It was hope suffocated by a despair which was so agonizing that it bled inside me once my eyes were open and I was staring down at my own hands, at the woman's eyeballs squished between my knuckles while the rest of her painted me like I was her canvas. I had danced in her husband's remains, twirling to a song that only I could hear. All of that made sense. It made sense that I had been turned into a monster like the rest of my class, and it made a sick kind of sense that I had been the one to hollow out a man's body with my own hands. I had been a part of 2022's Teen Purge, a fate I knew that I couldn't and wouldn't ever escape. There were still so many questions that I wanted answering. I wanted to know why the curse was triggered by a man-made substance that we had been subjected to, and why Kenji had been able to coherently text me before sunrise. Kenji, I had to find him before he did something that he would regret. No, I thought dizzily before he came to terms with what he had done under the influence. That thought was driving me crazy. But it was being pushed back, overwhelmed by something else entirely, which was taking over me, enveloping me. At some point, I dropped my phone and smashed the screen. I didn't know when exactly that was. Time was going so slowly. One minute, I had been pushing myself into a stumble run towards Little Woods' scrapyard, motivated by Kenji's cryptic text before something inside me snapped. I had a destination, an escape which was slowly building into a coherent plan. Before, I was nothing. I was nameless, a shadow teetering between life and death, while my body and brain were burned alive. I was in my blood, my bones, my thoughts, burning. I couldn't control myself as I screamed into the air, choked with smoke. Did it come from inside my head? No, no. It was a fire which had been set across the road for me. My thoughts were tangled and confusing and after a while, they weren't even mine. The longer that I burned, the longer I screamed into nothing. The physical presence which had forced its way inside my head had started to multiply. How am I supposed to describe this sensation accurately? How can I tell you this without sounding insane? It was the feeling of being drowned inside my own head, and bleeding memories entangled together which weren't mine creating a storm inside my head. Whispering voices fighting to make themselves heard. The unyielding force of dozens of thoughts and feelings had taken over me one by one. Initially, I fought against them. I tried to push them out. Because while they were seeping inside my thought process, parasites crawling into my brain, I was growing numb. My own thoughts were turning obsolete. Everything I was fading as my body became theirs. It happened slowly. I felt myself drop to the ground, still burning, the inferno in my brain and body growing brighter and brighter, numbed only slightly by my senses being snatched from me. I hit the ground but I didn't feel the impact. Instead, the whispering grew less incoherent until there were voices, real voices screaming inside my head. Mother! A girl's cry rang inside my skull. It wasn't the cry of a child, no, it was a teenager. You don't have to do this to us. 
and she was my age. Her wail was enough to stop my attempts at prying away the voices and I let go. I let each of them in. I let them bleed into me until I was nothing, and they were something. The force of her rattled me until I couldn't breathe, until I couldn't force my body into a sitting position. Lying face down on a singed grass with no choice but to listen to them. A sea of tangled thoughts plunging me further into the dark. A wave of ice cold water enveloping my own sense of being. As the nameless girl took over, spider wiping inside of me, my senses became entangled with her. I wasn't just hearing her, I was, I was feeling her. And within a single breath that choked from my hijacked mouth, I was her. Her cry was mine, strangled and twisted, ripping from my own lips. The stranger, I could feel their writhing body pressed against something harsh digging into our back, aching arms pinned above us. The smell of smolder scratched the back of our nose, a panicked feeling turning our gut. In front of us was a darkness speckled with blurred orange, shadows with no faces. The girl wasn't alone. Next to her were squirming silhouettes, and I felt a raging agony and frustration ripping her apart. She wasn't alone. Those were her thoughts, and while she was terrified of her fate, part of her felt like she could die as long as it was with them. Glimpsing a figure striding through the dark, a figure carrying a burning torch, I waited for her to talk. I waited for her to cry out, for some kind of explanation for what I was seeing. Before I could, however, the girl in her memory was being ripped away, and I heard her fighting back, trying to reach out, trying to leech back onto me. Her prying fingers failed to grasp hold, only for a second mind to find its way inside of me, harsher, more recent. The girl wasn't the only one to try and use my mouth to scream. Littlewood's high school gymnasium blossomed into mind, followed by sharp clarity. This kid was far more hesitant to reveal to me who they were. They held back a little, only choosing to show me their point of view of tipping their head back as a wave of water came down, drenching them and the rest of their class. Blood. That's what I had thought. I thought that it was blood drenching my face and clothes gluing my hair to my head and paste in my eye shot. It was blood that had been spilled and had already been spilled. The blood of my mother when I watched her gutted by Noah Sharp. Somehow, that colorless substance which had purposely drenched us had forced that one thought into our heads. We were covered in it. That combined with images in our heads of smoldering flame enveloping flashing hair an inferno setting our bodies alight. It was enough to drive even the strongest minds to pure insanity. And I was seeing it. I was seeing each experience. I was seeing the faces of loved ones driving them crazier. I felt their attempts to regain control of their mind, but the damage was already done. They slipped to their knees. Their screams joining a symphony orchestra of cries around them and saw exactly what I did. Burning, charred flesh and singed hair, agonizing wails rattling their skulls until they were forced to join. Their hands were in their hair, gripping and pulling and tearing at their scalp, bloody fingernails raking down their face, and a smile beginning to split their lips in half. The Wonderland smile, chasing away a logical fear and pain previously grounding them in a reality that they believed in. A craving was coming alive inside of them, a hunger to rid themselves of that pain, all of that blood. By making others feel the despair which had taken an unyielding hold, it was getting harder to differentiate whose memory from who. This time they were stronger. 
I saw sterile flooring and running feet. Everything was blinding white. I heard his gasp for breath. A nightmarish fear eating him up from the inside, pushing him to run faster. I recognized him. Not his psychotic laughter when he had kidnapped me a year earlier, but his struggle to keep breathing and to keep sucking in oxygen, which felt so far away. Just like the others before him, while his being seeped inside me, I had found myself once again plunged inside a memory. This time it was someone that I recognized. Not a stranger from past years, but a classmate just below me. Tommy Nolan had an asthma attack in junior year. Second period math, he had jumped up with a panicked look on his face, clutching his chest. I remember thinking that his breathing had sounded wrong. It was like a car engine trying and failing to start. His face had been pale, trembling hands clutching at his chest. Tommy wasn't the kind of guy who would intentionally attract attention to himself. He was an introvert through and through. However, this was the type of thing that he couldn't hide away from or push people away. I can't breathe. He had managed to gasp out before the teacher had escorted him out of the class into the nurse's office. What I felt wasn't an asthma attack gripping his chest. It was pure panic and fear squeezing the air from his lungs and stumbling his already clumsy steps. When Tommy reached a corner and threw himself into a run which was cut short by rough hands grabbing a hold of him and yanking him back. I didn't see the rest of Tommy Nolan's memory. At least I didn't see an escape or anything which hinted at where he was. I just saw the same. A coffin like enveloping darkness, restrained hands, raging fire. I didn't know if it was Tommy's splintered mind which had catapulted me from my own mind, or maybe he didn't want me to see everything. Before I could grasp onto his memory, he let go. The whispering voices let me go, and I found myself pressed against what grass would do. An intense pressure in my nose and crawling around the back of my head, blood pulling down my chin. I took a moment to gather myself. The sky was still half dark and half pink, pink and orange streaks taking over pooling black. Across the street, Lily Marriott was standing with the town's preacher's severed head, clumsily forced onto a makeshift pike. The man's eyes were still open, wide with horror. She wasn't moving, her scarlet hands still grasping the weapon for dear life. I got to my feet slowly, ignoring my own blood as spattered hands. I didn't think about the woman that I had murdered, or her husband, as I hopped onto a trashed bike which had been abandoned on the side of the road. It was still usable. Sure, it had bits of skin stuck in the wheels, but it would work. I pushed myself into a smooth pace which was normal. It felt normal like every other morning when Kenji and I biked to school. Instead of taking in the apocalyptic landscape around me, I focused on the road and finding my friend. That morning, I saw Max. I saw kids who were waking up and finding themselves painted in their victims. I saw them crying, screaming. I saw one girl do the same thing to herself as she had done to her little brother. But I was also seeing kids still entangled in their own undoing still tearing Littlewood apart. Under the last splinters of night, I saw my classmates around me. But I chose to be ignorant. I needed to find Kenji, and saving the townspeople who had been brought to the brink of despair was the last thing on my mind. Still though, I watched. I couldn't help it. There was a sort of morbid curiosity inside me, once I had been freed from the curse and then watching the rest of my class still in its iron grab. The varsity boys dragged an old man by his neck down the road, chanting at the school anthem. One of them was wearing somebody's skull which had been ripped off its flesh. The remnants of a bulging eye still glued inside the socket. They wore their football jerseys, and some of them made them even more terrifying. They were the perfect depiction of Noah Sharp, Gen Z version 
Littlewood's a golden boy turned psycho. Eleven years later, it had taken them too. The Red Hawks. Their war cries bled into the dull sunrise, stamping their feet to a beat only they could hear. The old man was struggling, his face a beat red, prying wrinkly fingers attempting to tug the tough rope clinched around his limp neck. But they weren't letting go, only laughing when he let out a pained cry, begging them to stop and just let him die. Red Hawks. They ignored him, pulling his limp body across the road. I could still hear their phantom yelling when I neared the scrapyard. Passing the diner, which was nothing but a blur of vivid orange, I saw a group of girls shrieking those horrific hyena laughs, diving into the flames and dancing in the smoke, entangling themselves and licking flames. Laughter twisted into screams and cries of agony mixed with a pleasure, a euphoria that I didn't even think existed. I had felt a writhing in every soul which had bled inside me, the craving to die. When I squeezed the handlebars tighter, I felt something shift inside me once the stink of smoke had traveled into my nose, and it was choking the back of my throat. Looking down at my palms, my skin had started to catch a light. No, I wasn't seeing things. I could feel it. Flames crawling on my arms, licking across my flesh and melting through my sweater sleeve. I opened my mouth to cry out, and in the blink of an eye, I was back inside that coffin-like tunnel, drowning Tommy Nolan's memory. He didn't want me to see it. He had pulled away before I could glimpse what exactly was in there. This time, though, it wasn't Tommy Nolan strapped to a metal slab. It was me. I was closed in, suffocating on my own sobs, and curling smoke already dancing in the back of my mind. All I could see was a fiery orange and red engulfing me, filling the tunnel. The thought hit me when my own body was writhing, dancing in vivid orange, getting brighter and brighter, licking across my flesh in sharp rivulets, singeing my hair from my scalp. I was in an incinerator. No, no, not just me. We. Tommy Nolan and the nameless girls whose screams had rattled my skull. All of us. We were in an incinerator. The shock of the vision as well as all of our pain entwining into one that pulled me back to uncertain reality. I didn't even realize that I had let go of my bike handlebars before. I was crashing down onto rough concrete, smacking my head on the curb. Stars exploded in the backs of my eyes, but the fire was gone, like it had never existed. Except I knew that it did. It had in Tommy Nolan's memory, as well as my future. An endless fire which had ripped away our flesh and sent us plunging into the dark. It made me wonder about that first memory. The girl tied to the tree in front of blurred orange. Was that how all of this had started? Did I see the first glimpses of Littlewood's curse? When I pushed the bike off me and checked my arms and legs for burns or signs of smolder, there was nothing there. Whatever had taken over my mind and crawled into my brain wasn't letting go, but I found myself hanging onto them. My head hit the ground and I stared at the sky, at red and orange clouds which almost resembled the end of the world. The sky, just like the ground below, had been set alight. Maybe it was the end of the world, I thought. Maybe Littlewood was really falling this time. I don't know how long I lay there trying to catch my breath, trying to force my maple syrup thoughts into fruition. I was trying to shake my head of a possible concussion, dislodging my brain from the puddle of the fog that it had fallen into, when I heard it running footsteps, bare feet slapping against gravel. I knew what this was. I had heard it as a kid an animal-like herd of kids which had congregated into their own tribe. I had heard them running past my house every year, and each time I thought they would catch me, I thought they would crawl through my window like Noah Sharp and his friends did. But this was my class. These were the kids that I had been going to school with for years. 
The sounds of their whooping and laughter brought me back out of it, just a little. Twisting to the side, I glimpsed them suddenly. White canisters. The ones that I had seen in the school. The ones that I had seen being put into the sprinkler system. They were everywhere, dotted across the road. Turned over on their head and leaking that same colorless substance. Onto the cement and into the air. I wonder if they had been purposely placed. Help me. Oh God, please help me. Just ahead of me, a woman in her thirties was sprinting. Her expression was wild with fright. Dark hair flying behind her in a whirlwind. I recognized the look on her face. It was exactly what I had felt a year prior when I had escaped Tommy Nolan. The girl caught my eye for a fleeting moment, and it looked like she might have found solace in me. Her mouth opened in a silent plea, her trembling hands raising above her head, before she realized what I was. I had been so focused on looking at her face that I had failed to see the mess of startling red painting the front of her shirt. She was screaming, sobbing into the wind. There was something wrapped around her left wrist, the entrails of some poor soul's guts fashioned into makeshift restraints. Twisting around, the girl dropped to her knees and buried her head in the ground. Don't, she screamed. Please, don't. She wasn't running, I thought. Why wasn't she running? When the hysterical girl started to crawl across the ground, they appeared like animals, like they had been staying back, teasing her with the hope of survival. There were eight of them, all of them carrying lead pipes. The look on their faces was feral. Blood-stained grins and empty eyes only seeing prey, only seeing another victim that they could tear apart. I started to get up, started to plan my escape, which was just to run and never stop running until I was away from them. When more war cries rang out, this time from the other side of the road, two separate tribes of kids advancing towards her. The second group were faster, and I recognized a face enveloped in the disgusting stain of red which had painted them. Kenji. He didn't look like Kenji anymore. I could hardly even see his face through a coating of red, smearing his cheeks and eyes which he must have done himself. War paint. Wielding a long thread of wire wrapped around his left wrist and trailing on the ground. My best friend joined the mass of kids closing in on the girl. His eyes were vacant and dark, empty of anything human. It was Noah all over again. Except this time, I wasn't a frightened six-year-old. I could stop it. I remember getting to my feet. Movement. Several heads whipped around. I'd already caught their attention, but their gazes barely strayed on me before going back to the girl. With my attention on him, I moved towards him, taking my steps slowly. Another kid crawled out of their hiding place behind a dumpster. This time, they looked younger. I didn't even want to guess how old. When half of the kids jumped the little kid while the others took care of the girl, I forced my legs to keep going to keep moving. But I stopped when the woman dived to her feet and made a run for it, pushing herself into a sprint. I watched Kenji pursue her like a lion chasing after a deer. While their steps were stumbled and clumsy, his were calculated. I couldn't move when he dived onto her back and brought her to the ground, her face smacking against cement with a meaty smack. She squirmed, fighting to get away but he was ready, forcing the metal wire into her mouth, wrapping it around and around until her face was turning red and then blue her mouth opening and closing like a goldfish. The wire sliced cleanly into her and red began to swim from her. I'll never forget which stained his hands. I knew what he was doing, squeezing tighter. He was using a garrote, and his prize was progressively more inevitable the more he forced the cutting wire through layers of skin until it met bone. Kenji. I was yelling his name before I knew what I was doing. I don't know how I got to him without breaking down, but when my face was buried in his back and I was sobbing his name, 
everything felt right. Even if it was just for a little while. Because, like a fairy tale narrating, the clock striking 12 and a magic spell wearing off, a dazzling sunrise broke through the clouds and the woman's gurgling had stopped. Just like the jerking movements of Kenji's hands as they struggled to cut through bone. I wasn't paying attention to Kenji when he woke up. I was staring at a little girl who had walked out of her house clutching a stuffed teddy bear and seeing the body of her mother on the ground. A numbness started to take over me, a heavy weight on my chest. I remember his arms were suddenly around me, and they were tight, so tight, almost suffocating the breath from my lungs. Kenji's body felt strange against mine, a trembling, rattling mass as he screamed into my shoulder. I had never heard him scream before. Kenji had always hidden behind a bright smile which had finally crumbled under the curse. Did I? His words collapsed into a sob. Did I, did I do this, B? The metal wire was still attached to him, coiled around his wrist. It marked him as a member of that tribe. No, I whispered into the damp material of his shirt. No, none of this was you. He laughed, sputtering on a sob. Uh, you're okay, I said. You're okay, just breathe. An icy shiver ripped its way down my spine when his lips found my ear. Do you really want to outrun the asteroid? He whispered, choking on a hysterical laugh. Do you think that will worthy be? His tone darkened. Is our suffering worthy? Kenji was hysterical and clinging on to me. I was still thinking about his words when footsteps had startled me. Kenji's phone hit the ground, followed by the curve of a heel splintering the screen. When I looked up, Miss Hawkins, our drama teacher, was looming over us holding a gun. It didn't look like the usual gun that I saw my neighbors use on wildlife. This one had a red-colored butt and fit perfectly into her hand. She shot Kenji first. The bullet hit his arm and he dropped to the ground. Miss Hawkins kicked Kenji onto his side, and I caught sight of a tiny dart-like needle sticking from below his elbow. When her gun zeroed in on me, I almost wished that it was a real one. I remember her pulling the trigger, but it wasn't just aimed at me. It was aimed at every other soul which had entangled itself with me. This had happened to every year prior to us, and I had a sickening feeling that I knew what was coming next. I woke to a nauseating feeling of movement to find my head uncomfortably pressed against the bus window. Outside, a long stretch of dead road leading to nowhere. There were no signs and no civilization. Nothing. It took me a disorienting moment to figure out that I was on a school bus. The same bus that I had seen in thousands of other memories. Next to me, Kenji poked me in the shoulder. He was awake and seemed with it enough to talk. Though there was a strange smile in his face which was twisting my gut, I turned around to face him and blinked rapidly because my friend's face morphed and blurred, twisting into hundreds of others. First, girls and boys in strange clothing like they were from the dark ages, and the distant sound of horseback, a carriage being dragged. I could smell wildflowers mixed with the stink of rot and excrement, hear the sound of birds and chains rattling around a jiggling rest. And then I was seeing strangers, each of them bearing clothes from different eras. I saw Tommy Nolan, and then Chrissy Lackey, Robin Chase, faces from previous years, all blood splattered, all wide-eyed, a haunting, hollow look on their faces, until Noah, until I saw his face twisted with anger and pain and frustration. His hands went to his hair in a sudden cry and he was slamming bloodied fists into his temples over and over again. Get me off this bus. I don't want to be here. I want to go home. I want to go back. Hey, hey, calm down. The voice was poppy. Her shriek echoed in my brain. 
As the bus they were on had collapsed into panic, and Noah was diving from his seat before being grabbed and restrained by guards and shoved back next to Poppy. I felt her gentle hand on his shoulder. Poppy's arms were around him, and Noah was relaxing into her embrace. We're going to the halfway house, Noah. Her soothing murmur inside my head was cut short when I sensed the coffin light tunnel once again. Flames. Getting closer and closer. And his screams. Ringing so loud on my head, horrifying wails of agony cracking my skull open. I felt my own clammy palms press against my ears, the force of his cry becoming my own. And B, I was sweating and shaking, choking on still vomit in my mouth, when Kenji waved a wary hand in front of my face and I found reality once again. When my gaze found his, Kenji had that smile again. He sat back with a sigh, pressing his head against the seat. You got it, huh? He chuckled. I wish I did. I found my breath, swallowing whatever the heck I had eaten in the last 12 hours. Got what? He shrugged. Do you remember when I asked you if you would give your life to destroy an asteroid? I had to think back to that conversation which didn't seem relevant until now. Kenji. He cut me off, his smile fading a little. I really did want to see my dad, he whispered. As he spoke, I found my gaze wandering and finding our classmates, who were either asleep or staring into the oblivion only they could see. And Kenji sighed. I imagined all of these scenarios in my head, that we would all come to the halfway house and heal and get better like all the other kids before us. And I would jump on a plane and go and visit my dad in Hokkaido. I noticed his hands were trembling in his lap. But I'm an idiot and I'm naive. He turned to me. We're just kids, right? What do we know? I was losing my patience with his cryptic words. What are you talking about? I was kidnapped like you. He said through a sigh. Last year, the night of the teen purge, I forgot to close our gate so I rushed to lock it up before I brought attention to our house, but I was too late. They were waiting for me outside. They knocked me out with the bat and I woke up on the roof of the school. He dug his hands in his lap, choking out a hiss. I was the only one left B. When I woke up, I was staring at people that she had pushed to their desks. My hands were tied behind my back so I couldn't move or try to get away in this girl. He trailed off, his gaze going to a stray raindrop on the window. This girl was dangling me over the edge, like I was bait over a shark tank. I was freezing and I was only in my pajamas, and I remember wondering if I was actually going to die. The bus went over a bump and I grabbed onto his hand, squeezing it as tight as I could. I waited for it, Kenji whispered. I waited for her to kill me, but she wrenched me back. And her eyes, her eyes were pitch black and hollow. His eyes filled with tears. She was smiling, smiling like it would thrill her to watch me fall like the ones before me. And she would have no mercy. As if his words were a narration, I was seeing the vision for myself. Like somewhere inside my head, the girl that lingered. I could see it. I could see pooling darkness a long way down. Kenji, his arm tied behind his back. A single strip of duct tape over his mouth. While arms were wrapped around his waist. Dangling him teasingly as he twisted and struggled in her arms. Like I was seeing it through her POV. I glimpsed tangled blonde curls in front of my face. A carving knife, a slick red, clenched in my fist. She held him tight, squeezing the breath from him. It's a long way down, huh? Her voice was a cackle clanging in my skull. I could see his white eyes, petrified as she pushed him closer and closer to the edge. Kenji continued in a low murmur. Um, but this girl didn't push me. She didn't kill me. Instead, she just pulled me close. 
I could smell her rotting breath, but through all the black whatever had possessed her, I could see that there was still something there. It was weak but still alive. Before I knew it, I was on my knees and she was in front of me, like she could see right through me, like she could reach into my head and pull out every memory that I had ever had. His voice trembled. She asked me a question, and I'll never forget it be, because it was what changed my way of thinking. Instead of being scared to die, I felt like I could finally embrace it. His words sent my gut galloping into my throat. I saw it. I saw her yanking him back onto his knees and pulling him close. What? I whispered, shaking away the vision. The girl was insistent on shoving her memory onto me. Kenji's eyes found mine and for the first time in the 17 years of the Teen Purge, I saw the Wonderland smile in broad daylight. I saw insanity brewing in eyes which had been darkened far before Littlewood's curse that had snatched his mind. It had been hours since the curse had let us go, and there it was, splitting my best friend's mouth apart into a Cheshire cat grin. It was exactly what I had seen in Noah Sharp's face before. He had sliced my mother open and gutted her. But while Noah's expression had been a blank slate, a monster, I only saw a tragic hope lighting up my best friend's eyes. But it wasn't real hope. Real hope was wanting to survive. It was forcing yourself to keep going no matter what. What I saw was that craving that I had felt when I had woken up covered in blood. The one emitting from every voice inside my head. The overwhelming pleasure which came with the thought of dying, giving yourself up. She asked me if I wanted to save the world. He said, his eyes twinkling. How cool is that? I was losing him. Oh, what did you say? I asked. He smiled. I said yes. What else could I say? She got this weird look on her face, this smile which was both maniacal and yet unbelievably sad. It made me feel like I would feel it too. I don't think that I'll ever forget it. Kenji turned it towards the window and this time, like he was refusing to admit it to my face. She told me that I will, just like her and the kids before her. That's what the siren inside her head said. At that point, I had hoped I'd be able to save the world and then visit my dad. I really thought it was as easy as that. His lips twisted, eyes lighting up. But then I understood what she meant. I finally understood and I wasn't scared anymore. How could I fear my own fate? She didn't mean me saving the world, B. She meant me and you. All of us in the past and present and future. Giving our lives for seven billion others. He turned to me with almost a cartoon-like eyes. You can hear them, he murmured. The girl had that exact same look in her eyes. Swallowing hard, I fought to breathe. What do you even mean? Haunted, Kenji said. They're telling you exactly what happened to them and you can't stop it. You want to pull them out of your head, but you can't. They're like a parasite that's taking over. I didn't reply. I couldn't. Can you tell me? His voice was small. How does this end? How do we save the world? Lying on a metal slab and staring at pooling black white flames licked across my flesh and set my hair alight, my body smoldering, burning bright. That was how it was going to end. Like Noah and every year before us, we were going to burn. And it made sense, right? Why wouldn't a town permanently get rid of their youth, tainted by a curse? But it still felt like I was missing something. And that something was getting closer as we approached the halfway house. B, Kenji murmured, are you okay? Instead of responding, I pressed my face into his shoulder and sobbed until my eyes were raw, until my chest was heaving. Outside, a fall was taking over nature, and for the first time in a while, I took a moment to take it in. Breathing in the smell of wet mildew and crushed leaves, 
drifting through the window in marvelling and beautiful decay. It's crazy how much you start to notice about the world around you when you know your time is running out. I don't think that I'll ever look at a tree the same again. In my cotton candy thoughts, still half asleep from the tranquilizer though, I was slowly conducting a plan to get the heck out of there. I refused to burn. When the bus came to an abrupt stop suddenly, I pressed my head against the window and peered out, hyper alert of my surroundings. I was seeing a large glass building which reminded me of a school or maybe a hospital. It looked far more modern than anything in Littlewood. It hit me that this was the halfway house that we had been promised solace ever since we were kids. I vaguely remembered our class being told about the curse and quickly following that up with, but we'll keep you safe like we do every year. We send our seniors to a place of healing to prepare them for the outside world after going through such trauma where they can mend. When in actuality, I knew exactly what it was. The whispering in my head had revealed the halfway house's true meaning. Inside that building, we were going to burn. We were going to burn and nobody was coming to save us. Not our parents or the town. Leaning back in my chair, my gaze flicked to the front where two armed guards were beginning to escort my classmates off the bus. I'd already made my decision when I grabbed Kenji's sleeve and yanked him under the seat in front of us. He let out a sharp gasp, almost a sound of protest. B, what are you? Slamming my hand over his mouth, I pressed myself into a ball, pulling him further under the seat. The thud 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 of the guard's boots sent slithers of fear creeping up and down my spine. They passed us. I could hear their breathing, their muttering to each other. The guards already knew our game. I sensed them checking under each seat, which motivated me to shuffle myself further under until I couldn't breathe. Kenji didn't move, his breathing sharp and heavy into the flesh of my palm. After a moment which seemed to go on forever, thudding boots retreated back towards the front of the bus. I squeezed my eyes shut when the engine started up once again, and the bus jolted, almost throwing us violently from our hiding place. Once the bus started to move, keeping a firm grip on Kenji's sleeve, I pulled us from our hiding place and lifted my head, scanning for somewhere better. The back was our best bet. When I started towards it, dragging Kenji with me, however, I spotted two familiar faces already in hiding, Jonas and Mira. Without speaking, we joined them. It was an uncomfortable squeeze, but we were safe. I allowed myself to breathe when the bus fell into a steady drive, but I didn't have time to relax. I was considering asking Jonas in low whispers why he had chosen to hide, when once again the bus came to a jolting stop. 47. The bus driver all but squeaked from the front. I had never heard a grown man's voice go that high, but the driver had managed it. Crap. Shooting the others a panicked look, I weighed our options. Three against one, we could easily get past them. No, no, we did a sweep of the bus. There's nobody on here. Jonas twisted around, shooting me a questioning look. What the heck is wrong with them? He mouthed. The bus driver's voice was eerily shaky. I could hear every tremble in his tone. Check, yes, uh, yes, I'll check now. When the driver started down the aisle in a bumbling stumble, ducking under each seat, I attempted to hide. I mean, there was nowhere to hide, though I at least tried to shove myself uncomfortably further under the seat until we were sardines. Hey! The driver's steps quickened towards us and I felt my body catapult into fight or flight. What are you kids still doing here? I lifted my head to meet his eyes, expecting anger. But there was no anger, however. I was seeing frustration and fear, trickles of pain and blooming in wide at cartoon-like eyes. The guy who was keeping his distance from us, I noticed. Like we were teeming with at the plague. It was a curse, not a contagious virus. Jonas jumped to his feet and raised his arms in mocking surrender. His smile was bright, but there was an underlying darkness in his eyes, and I had no doubt that he wouldn't resort to violence. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the whole halfway house thing, he said. I'd rather just ride back into town and go see my pops. His lip curled. 
I need to see if he's okay, man. No. The driver's eyes filled with tears. No. He shook his head rapidly, his arms trembling at his sides. No, you're not. Cocking a brow, Jonas frowned. The curse is over, idiot, he scoffed. Are you crying? Jonas! Mira's hiss was a warning. Shut up. I chose to stand at that point, and Kenji followed. The driver stiffened, backing away. Stay back, he hissed out. Do you hear me? His shaky hand went into his jacket, his eyes squeezing shut like he was expecting something. I'm taking you kids back to the halfway house, okay? He nodded at us like we would agree if he looked as pathetic as possible, and he did. The guy looked like he was ready to drop to his knees and beg. Just stay there, the driver hissed out. I caught the exact moment that he had dropped the notion of an authority figure. His lips twisted, when Jonas ignored his instructions and took a casual step towards them. If this guy had a gun, I knew that he would use it. But instead, he stumbled back with a cry. Don't you move, I, I mean it. Jonas smirked. Oh, like this. Another step. This time, the man let out a shriek. Jonas, Kenji said. Dude, stop. Why? Jonas twisted around to look at him. This guy's got problems. I caught a glimmer of that maniacal glitter left over from overnight. Let me guess, Jonas laughed. You see dead people. In three strides, he was face to face with the guy, nose to nose. This time, the driver didn't move. He was petrified to the spot, breathing hard, his mouth twisting and turning and trying to speak. But he couldn't. Jonas inclined his head and I could feel something building in my head. A pressure harsh enough to make my nose bleed. I found myself staring out of the window and outside. I noticed the patch of flowers which had been planted outside the halfway house they were drooping. No, not just drooping. They were blackening and rotting away into their soil. Petals being whisked into a spiraling breeze and coming apart. Kenji started forward and grabbed Jonas's wrist. And with the two of them so close, the man let out a childish whine which only delighted at Jonas further. Outside a tree that I had been sure had been standing tall and proud, it crashed onto the ground. The pressure was building in my brain and suddenly I couldn't breathe. Hey! Jonas yelled in his face. What did I say, huh? The curse is over. You don't have to be scared of us anymore, so how about you? It sounded like a mirror, pop like bursting bubblegum. I didn't hear the latter half of what he had said because the bus windows were suddenly bright red and dripping red. The floor was red, the seats and the ceiling. Jonas was red and I could feel splatters of it on my cheeks and speckled on my chin. The others had gotten the worst of it, but it was still painting me. The red was warm and wet like I had bathed in it. It was at my feet, pooling and spilling and splattering every color from existence. There was a dizzying moment when I thought it was raining blood before my brain found reality, and I blinked at the spot where the driver had stood in front of us, and it began to dawn on me. I hadn't been looking at the man when he had popped out of existence. I was watching the leaves on the tree outside start to brown and then blacken into nothing. Jonas, who looked like he was starring in some scary movie, twisted around to face me with wide, almost unseeing eyes. He looked like he might say something before the bus shook, and I forced myself to move to find the window. Kenji let out a hiss and I swallowed barf. Outside, the ground had started to crack apart, zigzagging raptures spreading like fire across the sidewalk. Kenji grabbed my arm and pulled me off the bus, Jonas diving off first and Mira on his heel. The world was crumbling around us, I realized. I could see it in flocks of birds flying across the sky in a panic. When we found solid ground, Jonas spoke. I was half listening to him, eyeing the growing sinkhole eating up everything in front of us. A woman jumped into her car and attempted to drive straight ahead, before a tree collapsed, crushing her car. This is the curse, Jonas said shakily. The four of us teetered on a safe piece of sidewalk. 
It's got to be, right? Mira wasn't speaking. I think she was frozen, traumatized. I could barely see through her red. Nope, Kenji murmured. He swiped blood from his eyes with the sleeve. It's because we're refusing to save the world. What? Jonas spluttered. The ground started to split in front of me and I staggered back, my stomach galloping into my throat. He's brainwashed. I found myself greeting out. Kenji really thinks that we're saving the world. Like, like the Avengers. Jonas grabbed his arm with a laugh. Dude, did you hit your head? Have you ever heard a human being explode? It kind of sounds like a pop. Like I said, it was just like bubblegum. I glimpsed a running man hand in hand with a little kid before both of them went pop against the store window, painting it a whole new color. Like a domino effect, townspeople started rupturing and lit the ground beneath us, and neither of us moved. I think we were too scared. I think even I wondered if we were too going to join them in the sea of red. I was staring at an old woman struggling to hobble through a panicking crowd when the mayor had announced himself via the megaphone across a particularly large crack. Armed guards surrounded him and I wondered if whatever this was would spare him. Stay exactly where you are, he yelled. Do you understand me? Do not move. When they risked coming closer, part of me reveled in seeing fear prickle in their eyes. Behind the mayor was our principal. His face beat red. The guy was seething. Can you kids even comprehend what you've done? Uh, yeah. I think we accidentally caused the death of Littlewood. I didn't say that, though. I wanted answers, and Kenji and Jonas seemed in their own world, watching our town crumble around us. The curse. I said shakily when they were close enough to hear us. Another tree behind us hit the ground, but it barely phased me. And neither did the little girl screaming for her mother exploding, showering the scruffy German shepherd that she was pulling in red. I had almost been desensitized to what I was seeing. It was all one big blur like I was dreaming. Who really started it? The mayor dropped his megaphone. If I tell you, will you hand yourselves over? Even his voice was shaking. I nodded. Of course. His lips twisted. No fighting, no more questions. Sure, I said, gesturing to the world around us. Eh, you should hurry up though unless you want to be brain soup. Huh? Jonas nudged me. B, are, are you serious? Oh, very, I said. I want to know why you made Noah Sharp kill my mother 11 years ago. The mayor looked like he might argue or even attempt to capture us right there and then, but he didn't give the order. Instead, he pasted on a strict smile. 200 years ago in the year 1799, the elders of this town made a grave mistake. He cleared his throat, suddenly looking uncomfortable. Littlewood was on the brink of collapse. Women were unfortunately barren and nothing they'd tried would work. We had no other option and we were forced to make a terrible choice. Our elders prayed to a certain entity and asked for good luck and prosperity. Prayed, Kenji frowned. The mayor was doing a good job of skirting around the real conversation. A certain number of young people in the town were burned at the stake as a gift to these certain entities in control of the town. He folded his arms. However, what they did not know is that these people were impure. They had engaged in certain activities which would be deemed. They screwed. Jonas cut him off. We get it. I could see the realization starting to light up in his eyes. The mayor's gaze found the ground. Indeed, he said. This act angered these entities the townspeople attempted to appease. So a deal was struck to avoid backlash, which they knew was coming when their food began to rot. Their animals mysteriously died, and rumors of a beast in the woods began to circulate. I hated that the guy chose to avoid eye contact when explaining why we were being punished for something which we had nothing to do with. So, every year following until the end of time, the 18-year-olds of Littlewood would be sacrificed as Littlewood's punishment. If a debt wasn't paid, however, the entities promised a wrath on Earth that would strike our town, 
closely followed by the world. This time, he lifted his gaze and looked me directly in the eye like I was supposed to feel guilty. Our town would fall and destruction would spread across the world, starting in neighboring towns and spreading from state to state, and then cities and countries far across the world, killing billions. He took a deep breath. Men, women, and children, newborns, all would perish under their fury. What does that have to do with turning us into psychopaths then? Jonas asked. Gone was the fight, all of his resolve. He had backed away like a cornered animal. This time, the man had the slightest of smiles. Do you think parents would agree to us murdering their children if we didn't make them fear them? If we didn't plant the idea in their head that it was their twisted child's life for the innocent townspeople? And forget that. Jonas scoffed a laugh when Mir dropped her knees and sobbed into the ground. You expect me to die for an already dying town? Mr. Lockhart, the sole reason why this town is crumbling around us is because you are still breathing, the mayor said. Right now, 47 seniors have been gifted as a part of our yearly ritual. That is not enough to stop them from destroying us. We need exactly 50 gifts. I don't care. He backed away, grabbing Kenji's hand. But Kenji wrenched away from his grasp and strode over to the guards with eyes which weren't scared. The girl who told me she had a siren in her head, he said softly. She said that I was going to save billions of lives. There was a dreamy smile on his face as I realized with a pang in my chest. But I preferred it to the agony twisting his expression when I had found him. I wanted him to be happy. To be at peace, but not like this. I wanted to run away with him, with Jonas and Mira, even if this twisted fate demanded otherwise. Kenji strode over to the guards and two out of four spontaneously combusted in their helmets, before the remainder grabbed and restrained him. For a moment, Jonas looked like he might join him. I saw it in his expression, and his eyes filling with tears. He took a shaky step forward like he would abandon self-preservation for a boy that he had confusing feelings for. A boy who was locked in a fantasy that nobody could pull him out of. Before he turned on his heel and ran, I watched him go, concrete splintering under every clumsy step. I respected that Jonas had chosen himself over the town, his own life over seven billion. He didn't owe Littlewood anything. No amount of persuasion would change that. Crap, the mayor hissed out, a look of panic twisting his expression. Go after him, we need 50 sacrifices. The guards hesitated. Go. He nodded to Kenji. Take him to the halfway house, they're waiting for him. At his words, I found myself backing away, and an almost childlike look of pain crossed his face. B. He stamped the ground like a child, like he was having a tantrum. Did you not hear him? He shook Kenji like a doll, his smile widening. You're going to save the world. No. I laughed at him, right in his face. He had to be kidding. He had taken away my mom and Noah and now Kenji, my entire class, to make up for a mistake that they had made. We were being punished for what they had done. For 200 years we had suffered because of them, and he expected me to give myself up. One look at Kenji told me that he would never follow me. He had already made his choice, but still though, I smiled at him, and he smiled back. Not a Wonderland smile, but a real smile. You're insane. I found myself spluttering. You want to die. And Kenji rolled his eyes. Die, he said. Who wants to die? No, B, I don't want to die. My friend laughed and the guard holding him flinched, as if a single movement or expression would trigger him to combust like the others. What did I tell you? I want to go visit my dad before Christmas. I want to move across the country and start fresh in a new college. I want to. He pulled a face. I want to eat New York pizza and kiss a stranger. Make mistakes that I learn from. Maybe I want to go skinny dipping in mid-December. Drive through late night traffic with my head stuck out of the window. Singing to some cheesy pop song. 
barf all over myself after too much drinking, and then do it all over again the next night because I have zero self-control. The more that he was speaking, the more I realized that I was losing him. No, I had lost him. Kenji was speaking in goodbye, and there was nothing that I could do to stop him. Because if he made his choice to give in to his fate, then what business did I have trying to save him? He would only hate me. He was doing a bad job of acting like goodbye didn't matter to him though. And the list goes on. Of course I want to live idiot. He laughed. Nobody ever wants to die even on the edge of life. Even with that storm cloud over their head. The suffocating pressure in their chest. All of that anxiety and pain nodding up their gut telling them that they're not worth it. That they should give up. They all still want to live. They want that reason to keep going. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Why I couldn't step in front of the traffic or do stuff to myself. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe not all of Kenji was gone. His eyes were far too sad for me to call them empty, brainwashed. But he stumbled over his words. How is it fair that I live while everyone else dies? Isn't that selfish? How could I stay breathing knowing that every year before I had sacrificed themselves? They didn't have a choice, I said through gritted teeth. Do you really think they willingly walked into the flames? Kenji held my gaze. It's not painful, B. You should know that. They're in your head. What was he talking about? It was painful. I had felt everything they had. And then came the waterworks. Kenji... See you around, B. He didn't even flinch when the guard holding him exploded, and another one grabbed onto him with quaking hands. Another grabbed Amira, and she seemed to be frozen. Let, let go of me. When one of them awkwardly strode towards me, I felt myself moving, backing away. One last look at Kenji. He was still smiling, and knowing that he was happy, he was at peace with his fate. I ran. It's been 11 days since I last saw him, since he became the 47th sacrifice. October 3rd, the trees started to blossom again. Outside my hiding place, the remnants of the diner, a rose bush blossomed out of nowhere. Amongst the chaos and the endless shower of red every time another townsperson was claimed, there it was. Life. Sitting in a battlefield of death, Kenji, number 47. I lit a candle for him. While I couldn't find any candles, so I set my neighbor's yard alight instead. October 5th, the ground stopped cracking apart and the townspeople stopped exploding. I think I know what happened. It was fast. Every living thing that was rotting away until nature was blossoming instead, until buildings stopped crumbling. The giant sinkhole in the town center closed up. It was such a drastic turn that I knew another one of us must have given themselves to the town. And with the way the wind blew, almost knocking me off my bike when I was scoping out the ruins of the town, I knew that it was Jonas. Idiot. Jonas had followed Kenji. He should have ran. Maybe there might be far more destruction if he did. As soon as this town started to mend itself, I knew that it was him giving himself up and totaling the number of sacrifices to 48. I wondered if it was enough to make Kenji's wish come true. Did my fallen classmates really save the world? Following them was Mira. I knew by the pace the leaves started to flower in the trees that she had fought until her last breath. Birds started to sing again. And the last person who exploded was ironically her mother. It sucks to be her. I think I'm allowed to laugh in this situation, right? And I did. I laughed until I cried. Until the remaining townspeople a power washed her off the sidewalk with everyone else. October 11th, and the sun is shining. The townspeople attempt to rebuild a broken town, and I sit here sipping a strawberry smoothie and hoping me sitting here and breathing will still bring their downfall. I don't have to hide anymore. Nobody will come near me. I'm like a plague. 
I'm skipping town soon, but first, I want to stay behind to see the fireworks. I want to know if Littlewood has truly been spared, or if they're just taking their time. I like to think my classmates are still here. I mean they are, I see them in spring flowers coming to life in fall. I hear them in the wind blowing my hair back. Some call me a coward for running away, while others beg me to keep going. And I will. I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for Littlewood to fall. Because I am the 50th sacrifice. While I breathe, their debt is not paid. My town's clock is ticking and I can't wait for a wrath to finally be bestowed on the ignorant. I know this entity is waiting for the 50th sacrifice. I don't think anyone could ignore the dead birds covering the street and that rotting odor in the air. And I'll be here sipping a smoothie and awaiting the end times. Who knows, maybe they're right around the corner. I'm going to ask you that same question again. If this was your choice, what would you do? Would you surrender yourself to a fate which will save billions of lives? Or run? I chose to run.